Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 555. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Dan Van Ashenden. It's the 10th Sunday. It's the 10th of December, 2019, the second Sunday in Advent. Okay, people, viewers around the world, our international audience, we welcome you back. Uh, we know you're not all Anglicans. That's fine. We know you, you, you love us and we appreciate that and you like what we talk about with the news. Before we get started, please share this program with your friends. If you get a chance, click on that like button when you see it on Facebook or YouTube. If you have not subscribed to the program, now's your chance. You're late to the game. But right now, if you're looking at YouTube, you see that little red rectangle that says subscribe, click it, and then a bell will appear next to it. Click the bell and you will get instant notifications from what I hear that there's a new show posted. Gentlemen, I think we're all back. No, we're not. I'm back where I belong. I'm in Connecticut. George is back in his church in Florida. Gavin, you're not in England. Where are you? Oh, I'm in Normandy. Uh, ah. And um, if it rains, we're going to lose the internet almost instantly. So. <laughs> <laughs> a lot to be said about uh, socialism in France, and that would be one of my commentaries as, an, uh, as a technology person. Yes, uh, the wires there are a bit loose, so we'll make sure it's not raining. You told me in the pre-show that a person may be walk, coming around you and cleaning <laughs> while we're doing this. Uh, the, the maid is on site, too. Uh, if... Our audience can withstand my wife using the hair blower downstairs while we're doing a show. They can certainly handle a, uh, a cleaning lady. Um, one, of the great, one of the great problems about my coming and going is that my, my capacity for domestic hygiene is highly intentioned but suboptimally efficient. And so wonderfully, we have discovered Iris, the uh, Iris like Iris needs employment and I need help. So um, this means I can come and go without without causing domestic offence. But one of the things that happens here because we have open fires, you, a lot of dust falls. <laughs> and my my story is it doesn't matter how much I dust up, you know, the, the, the dust is in the air. But the alternative view is I don't do it very well, and we need a professional. So we have a professional. My father, wise and wise in many ways, taught me early on, Kevin. If you don't want to continue to have to do something, don't do it well. That didn't really catch on to me until my first couple of years in marriage when my wife and I split domestic uh, uh, responsibilities 50-50. And I didn't like dusting. So I learned not to do it well, and I wasn't asked to do it again. And uh, I, a few of the cho uh, choice chores I didn't want to do, I just didn't do well. And that's that served me well for... <laughs> 30 years now. Uh, George, welcome back to... As the, uh... opposed to me, and Kevin, you know this from sharing <laughs> hotels with me over the years. Yes. That, oh my gosh. <laughs> that uh, I am uh, a rather bit of a neat freak, and it bothers me that Kevin doesn't make his bed with hospital corners in the morning when we reach <laughs> a hotel room. And that, you know, I would want to take a quarter and flip it and see if it bounced on the mattress, whereas Kevin has got this lump of sh towels and clothing and sheet and socks and a plate with a pizza crust on it. And I'm making room for the, bud bu the bed bugs we had in Kenya you know I don't want to kick them off the bed they were such so wonderful it, companions it was a bit of an odd couple uh, uh Felix and Oscar uh, so little... on to uh you're back in America now George how was your time in St. Bart's very nice very nice mm -hmm. indeed glad to be back uh not really fully up to speed I uh uh have uh got back the end of last week and have been scheduling doctor's appointments ever since mm. to uh uh, slice and dice skin cancers and take blood pressures and all these things and uh, my holiday in France was also a holiday from doctors and life and responsibility that's good all right let's move on to the news I think we covered our pre-show stuff uh, first story breaking this week was uh, Tori Belcom is no longer the rector of Truro in Virginia and uh, this has kind of been an uh, a completion to an ongoing story, uh, Truro, Tru through Tory Balcom, had tried to maintain peace with the uh, Episcopal Diocese of Virginia, uh, much to the consternation of some people in the ACNA and 
uh, others around the world, including ourselves, uh, the way it was handled. And I thought we could talk a little bit about this. Uh, first, George, what do we know? Well, on Friday of last week, the uh, vestry released an email to the congregation saying Tory Balcom was going to resign as rector. And at by year's end, he and his wife would be received into the Roman Catholic Church. Then there was a second statement is that allegations have been raised against him and an investigation has been launched that Tory Balcom will uh, cooperate with. Then this Monday, uh, and then, and this past weekend, the junior warden read this letter, plus an additional letter, which we were given and posted on Monday, saying that the vest, that this is not, uh, this is not an instance of misconduct in the sense of sexual or anything like that. Um, but to paraphrase one of my sources at the parish, uh, Tory was just an SOB to his staff. So I don't know, you know, there are plenty of SOBs in the ministry. It's uh, standing operating, it's SOP, standing operating procedure in some churches, that the uh, rector is a little king or tyrant. But it's unfortunate that uh, he's leaving under a cloud. Uh, but Kevin, I want to uh, sort of stretch out what you said earlier. It wasn't that uh, Truro Parish was cooperating with the Episcopal Church. We, no. we, people cooperate all the time. Mm -hmm. I cooperate with the synagogue and lots of stuff here in town. Rather, they were seeking to launch joint, joint training and teaching ventures with the Bishop Diocese of Virginia. So they were going beyond uh, uh, neighborliness to active cooperation and in advancing a particular agenda and they didn't clear this with the bishop and they didn't clear this with the ACNA and the attitude of Truro was well we're a rich parish the attitude that came across whether rightly or fairly was we're a rich parish we can do what we want and if we're going to do this we're going to do this and so uh, John Guernsey sort of squashed this and uh, sort of uh, squelled the rebellion because Truro was acting as a semi-Baptist congregation in its uh, understanding of ecclesiology, and now we have, and now we're at this point. People have been writing letters complaining about Tory Bauckham because he doesn't do what they want. Well, every church is people writing letters complaining sure. about ministers who don't do what they want. So please don't hear us me to be saying that there is misconduct or he's a bad person. Tory is on a faith journey, and he believes that this will lead him to the Roman Catholic Church. But that's not really where you can be if you want to be an ACNA rector. True, true, true. Um, we also have news over in England, a couple news stories. First, uh, St. John's uh, Seminary closing. Yes, this is St. John's Nottingham. When I was uh, training to be a priest, uh, St. John's Nottingham was the really cool place to go. Uh, it, where you went if you wanted guitars, singing in tongues, uh, and... Um, and the prospect of, of converting people to Jesus in, in a high octane, charismatic way. And a lot of people said, well, if, if they've got the future right, if the future looks like that, this is the best place to train. But if, if the taps of the Holy Spirit don't stay on in the way they, they appear to be in the 1970s, uh, then this would be disastrous because you'd be training people um, in, in, in ways that aren't particularly methodical, deep, profound, and Anglican, you know, especially not Anglican. Uh, so it's, it's in a number of, it's interesting that, that St. John's Nottingham should have folded at this point because um, the great vision for renewal that was the church, within the Church of England in the, in the 1970s, particularly driven by David Watson um, and a few other, no, that question, what's it left because uh, it appears to have left a, a, a whole range of seminaries that are uh, full of feminism, the relativism, and and religion, but they don't convert people. Um, they they their mission mainly is to is to soothe people and allow them to experience a bit of comforting spirituality. Um, that's not going to save the Church of England. Well, where do the most bishops send their uh, ordinance now? In the Church of England, there are so many different models of doing things. Um, the the bishop might refuse to let you go somewhere, but he's unlikely to force you to go. So okay. there's a, there's a, there's a, the ordinands themselves 
partly choose and theological colleges do everything they can to to attract people um but uh if i can be um uh, narcissistic for a moment I, to go, I got an graph saying uh one more cathedral is selling its wares and um in this case flogging its its pews we think you have views on on the mission of the church of england and its and its cathedrals and uh, would you like to say something so I, I did, I, I gave him a 15 minute lecture and said, this is the context in which I'm making my, my remarks. But the, the phrase he cho chose to use was the Church of England run out of belief, money and people. Um, it, and, and that's I think, good though, yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably right. The, the problem is that um, it, it doesn't have beliefs. This is, this is coming back to theological colleges. The, the way in which people are trained is not to call the country back to Christ uh, in a way that we were very comfortable with even 20 years ago, the decade of evangelism, but it's to offer some form of spiritual therapy. So the theological colleges are set up on that basis. It's the entire feminism. I'm afraid they, they subscribe, they, well, essentially they subscribe to Marxism rather than Jesus. And this might sound a bit polemic, but it's becoming more and more clear to me as, as time goes by that the really critical paradigm shift that's taken place in Christianity in, in England at any rate, and I think throughout the West, is this move from love to power. So, so love in the Christian sense, I think we should probably use the words holy compassion because otherwise love can mean sleeping with the person you like most. Um, but, but holy compassion has been exchanged for power and, and power in this sense means the redistribution of power from those who used to have it to those who are victims, which sounds kind and caring, and it's it, it, it draws on little bits of the prophecies of Isaiah, and, and but 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 in a utopian way. And what the Church of England has done is is to bought in by buying into feminism, it's bought into power rather than her passion, it's into justice rather than holiness. Um, and that's why it, it matters enormously that that there aren't any theological colleges that are training people in in biblical apostolic Christianity. They've, they've gone over to this new zeitgeist narrative. Here in America, at least, we have an adoption of pantheism. Love is love. You know, it's it's the God is the force from Star Wars. And uh, use the force, Luke, is the way to uh, get people encouraged, enlightened, and on to the work of the Lord. And I, we just had a story we posted uh, from Jeff Walton about a visit to the Diocese of Michigan from presiding Bishop Michael Curry. Uh, can you give us the details on that, George? Northern Michigan, but before we go there, I want to sure. press Gavin, Gavin a bit more. Um, I think it's instructive that essentially, as I understand you, Gavin, uh, it's a marketplace for seminaries. In other words, the failure of St. John's is not that it had some scandal or or it was undercapitalized. I assume most seminaries are undercapitalized, but rather they couldn't compete in the marketplace. And the marketplace in the Church of England was that ordinance are that the people coming forward are not those that are comfortable with the new wine movement or the charismatic mm -hmm. renewal movement. They are more corporatists and whatnot. And you can you compare that situation to the United States where um, Episcopal seminaries that uh, are liberal and Catholic uh, either have closed or I think general, general theological seminary, which is was the flagship, is the flagship, has less than two dozen students. Whereas Trinity Seminary and uh, other seminaries of that ilk are doing very well in an open marketplace. And the IRD has done these studies of uh, seminaries and Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, uh, United Church of Christ seminaries that are on the liberal side are shutting down left and right. Whereas those that he heed to a more traditional uh, Christian worldview um, are doing quite well. So that the market, uh, you you made the you made the uh, comment at a previous episode that the market uh, uh, place really doesn't apply to the English world or mindset, um, whereas in the United States it really does uh, seem to apply. I think that's right. And so, what, why is the story different in the states in terms of the marketing of seminaries? I think in 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 Anglican terms, um, 
everywhere has become wellbified. Mm -hmm. So, so essentially, um, uh, we used to have the Anglo-Catholic, the the muscular evangelical, and the effete mi liberal middle. Uh, we've lost the Anglo-Catholics, and Stephen's house. Uh, uh, I, I was having done with the University of Oxford, who are um, trying to impose women celebrants uh, on St. Stephen's House. Uh, and I thought, well, that's a terrible thing, until I discovered they already have capitulated. The, 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 one, the most Anglo-Catholic college in the whole of the Church of England already has a woman celebrant celebrating. So, I mean, if you're, if you're truly an Anglo-Catholic, where on earth would you go to train? Because they've already given in. So the University of Oxford is saying, well, OK, you have one a week. We, we'd like you to have three or four a week. And one, the poor, poor St. Stephen's House is faced with trying to decide on whether it goes independent from the University of Oxford over who decides the rota for how many women celebrate a week. I mean, it's, a, it's a terrible situation to be in. So anyway, the Anglo-Catholics are... Have, have effectively diminished to the point of, of being uh, cos cosmetically integrated into the Church of England. The muscular of the other end are uh, uh, just Anglican. They have a great deal of trouble persuading the rest of the Church of England that, that uh, at Oak Hill they're Anglican in any meaningful sense. And so all you have in the middle then is this effete liberalism. And the reason why it's surviving is that for as long as there is money to train people, they will go to those places. There isn't anywhere else. That that mixed economy of Anglicanism that allowed for um, a cross fertilization of different models of holiness has given way to a bland, feminized, liberalized spirituality. And so, for as long as there's any money at all, uh, they, their bills are paid. Gavin, is there in the United States we're seeing a phenomenon of, of older ordinance? Uh, I was probably in that late, I was in my late 20s and I was a little bit older than some of the other students, three or four years older when I went to seminary. And I think mine was the last generation of people who went straight into seminary after maybe a year or two of work. I'd had five years, uh, seven years of employment after college before I went to seminary. And that, that model of residential training for three years was designed in a t an age and a time where there were single men uh, who could uproot themselves, spend three years in a place and live frugally. And now when you're in your 50s and starting ordination, you have family, you have children. Um, and so, for instance, in our diocese, we have people train who are in that plot place. They train for two years at a Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, which is a Reformed Presbyterian place, and then go off for a year uh, of Anglican finishing school, either to Neshota House or what another place. Because the model of ordination has changed, we have these second career, third career people. Is that affecting the Church of England's uh, sort of model of theological education? Now, enormously. In my lifetime, we've moved from the model that you've described, George, which was mine too. I remember when I sat down and said my advisor, uh, I, I've, I've trained and qualified as a lawyer. I'd like to go to the bar for ten years and 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 and, and you know become a grown-up professional and then give myself to the church in my early thirties. And he said, "No, no, no. We want you to go now. Sacrifice your career for the church, and uh, and 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 you know we'll put you on a fast track to to uh, uh, of, of experience." Well, the next thing that happened was they changed the model completely. But effectively, what's happened is it seems to me the Church of England has turned into a kind of rather like a religious primary school. Primary here is sort of from, from ages three to 11. And what you have in particular is, is large, large groups of ladies who in their mid forties decide they want to be religious primary school or they want to be clergy, but, but in the primary school model, in the same way that primary schools became completely feminized, there are no men in there whatsoever. They're, 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 they're run entirely by by educated middle-aged ladies. The church, adopting messy church, for example, has become a form of religious extended primary school run by part-time, very well-meaning middle-aged ladies doing self-seeking spirituality and religion. But this is this is not the church. And, it, and, and, and nor is it a place where a wide range of people feel comfortable um, because it's a very distinctive kind of ethos. So, so I, I think it's one of the things that has uh, contributed to the to the very rapid demise of the Church of England and what used to be an immensely rich spirituality. 
Do you think it has anything to do with the feminization of the tr uh, the absence of men in the pews? Yes. Uh, that, and that they're very, uh, well, I would say there are very few working class men who can walk into any Church of England parish and look up and see somebody whom they identify with. Um, it was always difficult. I used to go into the pub. I, I, I used to, to gather men together and kind of get in it first particularly as in, in terms of, of, uh, of vicars who were seen as being rather limp-wristed and of, 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 of questionable levels of hormone facility. And so, uh, you know, the men would test you to see whether you were actually a half-decent man of any kind that they could trust, one of them essentially. And until you proved yourself to be one of them, they wouldn't pay any attention, they wouldn't offer you any respect. Um, that's complete, that's disappeared entirely. With the homosexualization of the church and the feminism of the church, there are huge swathes of, of ordinary, um, and by that I don't just mean masculine, but I mean wider, wider vistas of, of sociological profile that are completely untouched. And the, the trouble is that, that, that Christianity, religion is always, in, despite the fact people complain the patriarchy has been running it, religion has always, in terms of a psychological profile, of, so the problem is that the moment you lose the balance, you go totally feminine. And I think it, total feminization has, means that evangelism is very difficult. And this, uh, this is one thing I've never quite understood about the English scene compared to the American scene. It's, in essence, the absence of religiosity among, if you will, the Tommy Robinson types of, in the United States, people people just assume that the conservatives are members of the religious right, that um, that there's a faith component and that people like uh, uh, Franklin Graham, who is not a minister, but he's a, a, a faith leader, he's a layman, uh, he uh, has a conservative voice and he has a religious uh, presence. And that is non-existent as far as I can tell in, in England. Is I'll take let me take a risk and tell you a story of why <laughs> Tommy Robinson came to see me. <laughs> and uh, I went to see uh, him. You, bro you, broke up for, I, you broke up for a second. If you want to repeat that? Right. I'll, I'll start the sentence again. A while ago, Tommy Robinson asked to see me. Uh, and I went to see him. And, and I decided I had one shot to evangelize him. And so uh, in the context of our conversation, I said, you're doomed unless you turn to Christ. And if you turn to Christ, I will help you in your turning to Christ. But if you don't turn to Christ, you're, you, you know, nothing you stand for, uh, because of course there is a disparity between what he appears to stand for and the demonization of the press and, and, and what he really is, which is something rather different. But I said, unless you turn to Christ, and I'm here to help you do that. that that's my, that's my, my sole concern is, is to, help you have a relationship with God so that what you want to do to society is transformed by Christ. Uh, anyway, it's, he had an argument, you know, you Christians, you're, you are wet, you are weak. Uh, he gave me a kind of Nietzschean rant, effectively. He didn't know it was Nietzsche he was channeling, but, but it was. And he said, the only people I respect, the only Christians I respect are the are Polish clergy, a Polish Roman Catholic clergy. And he said, if you lot were like Polish Roman Catholic clergy, I'd give you more time of day. Um, I, I argued with him. I, I, I asked if I could pray over him. And uh, a week later, I saw a YouTube clip where he said, this, this religious nutter bishop came to see me and tried to make me a Christian, but he failed. <laughs> <laughs> so, what um, is it about what is it about a Polish Catholic clergyman that would uh, uh, appeal to that to the, the man in the white van in England? Well, the interesting thing is it 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 would be a kind of Christianized version of Islam because actually, although Robinson hates Islam, also respects it because it is muscular, it's powerful, it's authoritarian, it's confrontational. Uh, it doesn't compromise, and there's something about uh, the white van man, the would-be or ex-football hooligan, that respects that level of muscular, uh, potentially violent uh, ways of, 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 of doing life. Um, but, the need to, but, but for him, there would need to be something between your, uh, your tough, 
Muslim terrorist and your limp wrist and 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 your your part-time lady your part-time lady vicar um so the part-time lady vicar doesn't do it the full-time man vicar doesn't do it uh the roman catholic priest standing uh in you know, doing a lech falesa or whatever gains his respect but anything short of that doesn't um i don't know the way to do is i tried it Well, I think we, it's time for a few martyrs in the Church of England that the blood should flow so that the faith flows. But that's easy for me to say. <laughs> it is easy for you to say, George. I, I expect the Lord may provide it <laughs> in time. Well, you have an election coming up too, right? Have a what? An election. Somebody an named, uh, yeah. <laughs> an auction. I had an <laughs> Well, you're in Alexa. French, and so there's a translation <laughs> issue going on uh, between my microphone and your ears. But uh, uh, to Boris or not to Boris, to Brexit or not to Brexit, uh, uh, seems to be some uh, a issue that will be decided within 48 hours. And uh, there's lots of information and disinformation and a typical. Uh, campaigning going on. Uh, what's the latest? I, I've kept politics. I've kept out of politics for most of my life, mainly, mainly because I was so fed up with uh, a bunch of left-wing colleagues never, never stopping to offer uh, religion and um, uh, and the whole cultural progressive agenda as part of their sermons. But I've given up keeping out of religion, out, out of politics, because I think, I think things have changed. <laughs> Uh, I think the the agenda of the progressive left is so anti-Semitic and so anti-Christian that uh, it's entirely proper for a Christian to stand against them. It, it, that doesn't mean one necessarily is pro-conservative. Um, and anyway, the, the left and the right are not they are they are not symmetrical opposites by any means. Uh, one can want to keep certain values in society that have worked for its mental and p political and financial hygiene and at the same time want some very, very valuable safety to make sure that the poor and the weak and the vulnerable are taken care of. Um, there isn't an obvious place in the political spectrum to express that kind of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, mix. But at the moment, uh, anything could happen and we could either find ourselves left with a hung parliament that, that, that uh, continues this dreadful political impotence and fostered rage between the right and the left. Or Boris could win by a landslide and and nobody has any idea at all. Um, I, 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 I just, you know, I, I have no doubt at all that if the left win, they will do what they always do, which is um, take us further into debt at a point where the whole of the Western world uh, is on a knife edge of having the debt bluff called um, and banks and institutions fold under under pressure so the thought of making ourselves more vulnerable to that is really quite problematic. In, in, and in, in this mix, from the left. in this mix gavin of a hyper politicized life in england uh we had a little story where the bishop of sheffield uh Wilco pete, pete wilcox um mm -hmm put out a pastoral letter that in, an, in a very English, uh, using double negatives and uh, it's, it's insinuation says, don't you dare cooperate with the Franklin Graham crusade. Because oh, yeah. Franklin Graham is controversial. And in, the, and in looking at some uh, Facebook groups, the comprising of English conservative evangelicals, they were all saying, yes, Franklin Graham is a bad person because he supports Donald Trump and all this and that. And if you took their American counterparts, I think you would have a almost a complete mirror opposite. W what's wrong with Franklin Graham in the English worldview? That would cause a bishop to go out of his way and say, don't cooperate with this crusade. Well, I think there, there, there are two things that, that view is presented in, in, in English Christian culture and Anglicanism. Anglicanism has moved a very long way to the left. Uh, into, the, into the politically correct culture, it breathes it, it, it exudes it through all its pores. All the, all the bishops 
subscribe to it. More bishops subscribe to politically correct culture than subscribe to the resurrection. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, but it's not just that. The, the, the whole of our society and culture has moved drastically to the left in the last 10 years. Uh, and well, we could argue how that came about and what does it, but, um, but it means that people who used to be really quite moderate politically uh, are, are deemed a right wing. And so, um, you know, if Billy Graham himself came to, uh, to do a mission uh, back, from, back from the dead, uh, the values that he came with in the 1960s and 70s would be deemed to be so far the right to be found and unacceptable. I, 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 you know, Billy, the Billy Graham Foundation hasn't changed. Uh, English culture and English bishops and Anglicanism has. And well, they've they moved would, unthinkingly to the left. Yeah, they would just claim him to be a phobic. You know, phobia this, yeah. phobia that, phobia this. Yeah. You know, that's uh, kind of what's been happening in our culture is it's not just not to like it, but you have to proclaim that the other side hates and Christians and, hate and Jesus hates and uh, people like uh, Franklin and Billy Graham hate. Now, Franklin doesn't do himself a lot of favors, um, but it, it, it's benign and, in this greatest context. And it's sort of funny because as he's being beaten up by the left in England, Franklin Graham is being beaten up by the right in America because he's saying, give Chick-fil-A's leadership a few days a week to explain themselves, give them the benefit of the doubt. And so here, the poor man is getting it both directions from people who are saying Chick-fil-A will never go back because they're a sellout to the leftist worldview. And then the leftist worldview of, as represented by English bishops saying Franklin Grand is is beyond the pale. We can't have this man in our town. Uh, so we're, this, this is an, we're in a north place of, of considerable anxiety in terms of polarization. I've just finished reading Douglas Murray's of Madness of Crowds. And if you really, really want to frighten yourselves, read the last chapter on trans. The level of, the level of psychotic collective madness we have got into appears to be something we can't turn back from as a society. Uh, it's it's going to get worse, George. I, I suspect you're right on that. I mean, feminism has lost to transgenderism, mm. and uh, uh, it's it's interesting to watch. The only living feminist alive today are the those who oppose transgenderism, who figure out, wait a minute, if there's no gender, there's no feminism. And, oh, I have nothing to speak for. Ah, so, you know, we'll have to watch how that plays out over the next uh, six years. But I think. Uh, at this point, the pendulum is really swung, and especially at the university level, people are losing rights left and uh, left and right to uh, transgenderism, and the uh, there is no gender uh, caucus. I did want to, before we end here, talk about Northern Michigan uh, with the visit uh, of presiding Bishop Michael Curry, George. Uh, what's the latest news there? Oh, the presiding bishop uh, did uh, is on his God is Love tour or Love Wins. I forget its exact name. Any uh, way of love. And he took it to uh, northern Michigan. And Jeff Walton of the IRD wrote a really great story. Uh, essentially, uh, Michael Curry gave his uh, regular stump speech, but it was framed by the liturgy put together by the Diocese of Northern Michigan that begins by saying creator, redeemer, and sustainer, which is, I think they call it a modalist substitution for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. to not using scripture, but poems for gospel readings and using the prayer book for New Zealand, the really artsy fartsy one uh, for, the, for the prayers. So it's substituting the, the Lord's prayer, for instance, with a, a New Zealand prayer that begins, instead of our father who art in heaven, you say, eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. Uh, as, as Jeff Walton points out, this is all about narcissism. This is not about Christianity or God or Jesus. It's not. It's religious atheism. narcissism. I just, I just, pantheism. I just yeah. need to tell you in brackets, I spent 15 years writing liturgies like that. Oh, as really? A <laughs> I really, I really, really did. I didn't change the gospels for poems, but but that kind of stuff it flowed out of me. I was good at it, um, wow. but I had to repent because, as you quite rightly said, it was narcissism. The uh, and 
No, the di a little bit of history here. About 15 years ago, Steve Waring and I, the Living Church, broke a story that a bishop-elect, uh, who was a priest of the Diocese of Northern Michigan, was also a practicing Zen Buddhist priest. And in his parish, he had uh, done some innovations, like dropping the creeds and, and all this and that. And for the first time in maybe 100 odd years, a bishop was turned down by the House of Bishops. This is before the Mark Lawrence and the Gene Robinsons. I mean, may not have been around Gene Robinson, but nonetheless, he was turned down but because he was theologically not on the up and up. And life goes on, and the theology that this man was espousing 15 years ago is now the mainstream in the Diocese of Northern Michigan, which has less than 700 members on average in church on Sunday. We t began the show talking about Truro Parish, and that has more than 700 people. One parish has more than 700 people than this whole diocese does on Sunday. Um, Truro Parish is going to pull out of this. It's going to be just fine. They just have to clean house and get their act together. But I'm, I'm afraid that the death watch is, it has begun for so much of the Episcopal Church, typified by places like Northern Michigan. Sure. Well, we talked last week about, uh, you know, kind of the death watch in Canada. Uh, the Episcopal Church is not going to be far behind. They have, obviously, Trinity Wall Street money. I got to walk by Trinity Wall Street the other day. Still has his money, doing a big renovation on the inside. Um, so we'll have to see what happens in the long term there, guys. Uh, let's talk quickly about our schedules. We got Christmas and Holy Weeks, or Christmas week coming up. Uh, are we able to tape on Thursday or Friday this week, or you want to do something next week? I can tape. Gavin? I, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, traveling, I'm traveling back tomorrow. So our, our election is on Thursday. I might be... I think I'm planning up to watch it, <laughs> to stay up and watch it all night because I don't know if I'll be able to go to bed otherwise. Uh, but yes, well, we can we can find a date. Yeah. Actually, Peter Old and I did a live stream with the last uh, the Brexit vote. Maybe we'll do something like that again uh, as the the vote happens. Kind of fun Peter, to do. Peter is young and vigorous. <laughs> he is. Have, I know. <laughs> have, 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 have <laughs> <capacity for> endurance. <laughs> <laughs> and he loves stats and numbers. He, he's a, he's fun to have on the program. All right, gentlemen, another great show. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 555. What are we going to do when we get to 666 of Anglican Unscripted? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the complications. Hey. <laughs> 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 <laughs>